I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Campfire Talk. This is where we sit around the fire, put our feet up with a cold drink, and let the conversation flow. We were just discussing, before I started recording, uh, what we wanted to talk about today. And what was that you brought up, TW? Uh, you know, because it's in, this nobody is in, wants to hear about the behind-the-scenes stuff. We talk about naked Bigfoot goats <laughs> that are trying to molest horses. <laughs> <laughs> See, everybody wants to hear this stuff, and this is what we talk about. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if that's the topic of conversation today, but you know. Well, if we got kids listening, then that, that doesn't need to be our topic for sure. Yeah, we we definitely have kids listening, so. We got we got to watch the language. <laughs> so, Forrest, you were talking about um, the hel- we remember the helicopter thing that we've discussed on on the other show before flying around your property. So, I, I guess it's interesting to bring that up again about um, what you found out about that. Well, <clears throat> actually, I haven't found anything out about exactly who was flying that helicopter, but. It kind of, after I had a discussion with uh, uh, the property owners across the road, which are no longer, it's evidently no longer Post Oak Ranch. Uh, It's been bought out by someone else who's selling the land off, but they're not going to sell it off uh, so that somebody can build a subdivision over there. That's something they want to preserve the pristine quality that makes the Texas Hill Country so famous. And... Um, all you Californians want to move here. Um, yeah, hey, anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you, you were, you're welcome to come as long as you're not liberal. So uh, this happens to be a red uh, state. You're probably going to bleep me out now for that. But anyway, uh, um, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, what I found was that I actually talked to this lady across the road, and I said, "What did, did you happen to have a heli- helicopter flying around? looking at property out here and um she said do what (laughs) she was just shocked you know and i said yeah i I told her about the helicopter and the incident and everything and and i said you know i I even told her i said about it that it hovered over there across the way across the road and um uh, (laughs) i said the creep factor entered into it and i mean it was creepy when that thing, when I told you guys that thing turned around and they were looking at all of us three women standing out here looking at them. And it was just, um, I don't know, they just look like a giant bug in the air. I've always just thought that about helicopters. They look like a giant dragonfly for some reason. That's what they look like. And um, so she said no absolutely not that they did not have any developers out here flying around looking at the property and that wasn't the the that wasn't what they were striving to achieve over there with having bought this ranch so uh that was out of the question so i don't know what those guys were doing guys I, and I, I frankly find it kind of suspicious really and well, it is um, for sure i mean that's kind of odd. <clears throat> yeah yeah well, she she didn't well, she wasn't happy about it either when I told her about it. She was not happy about it either. So, but, it's like yeah. David joined yeah. us. What, what do you say? <clears throat> I'm here. Weather's been nuts. <clears throat> I don't know where Milo is. Milo was ready yesterday, and today he's vanished. So, <laughs> <laughs> David, what are you having for weather out there? Well, let's see. Uh, Friday it was in the mid 80s. Today it's 44 and rain. Oh my God, we were just we were just bemusing about that earlier. <laughs> yeah, North Carolina is trying to kill me right now. Sinuses, yeah, I had allergies. You bet it. Yeah, yep. <laughs> oh, do you guys get pollen out there? 
Well, me and Will have sinus problems running in the family, so yeah, mine are, mine are aggravating me right now, to say the least. Mine are okay until it rains, and it's been raining a bunch here, so <laughs> it's not a fun time. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, I'm not going to complain about the rain. We sure didn't get any rain last year here in Texas, but it's raining now. It's I mean, a... David, it was, it was, I was uh, looking, I had to turn the AC on last week because it was in the 90s. And then two nights ago, <clears throat> it was 38 degrees, so we were back to the heater. So I was like, my gosh, I, I just want Mother Nature to make up her mind. But, you know, it's like I told you guys earlier, this is Texas. Just if you don't like the weather today, stick around a day or two. It's going to change. So. <laughs> You know, normally it's it's hot here already. It's kind of the beginning of summer in this area. And uh, it's been just kind of cold and rainy. So everybody that's, you know, from this area says, oh, yeah, it's the first time it's been like this in 20 years or whatever. But I'm thinking, oh, nice. <laughs> it well, is a nice change, though. Lap. Yeah, I, I take it, this over 100 plus degrees. It'll, it'll be hot and all the way through October, November, so... Yeah, I'll take it for the just, time being. I'm just ready for it to warm up and stay that way. My sinuses can't tolerate mid-80s one day, 40s the next day, 70s the next day, 50s after that. I can't do that. So anything interesting in the Bigfoot world, anybody? Well, I actually, David, you're in North Carolina, and... I've seen some documentaries about some real problem uh, Bigfoot situations in Northwestern North Carolina. And I just wondered, uh, I want to get your comments if you've heard of anything like that. And what are your thoughts? The last big thing I heard of was in Western North Carolina in the Appalachian mountains. I can't remember how far back it was, but, they had a couple of areas up there where they actually had to call in the military to put a few down. Really? Yeah. Okay. So they would bring in uh, probably helicopters with uh, very, very sensitive sensors, I would assume, to find these things and then uh, give them a taste of lead or something? Or do you have any details on that? Well, basically, they'll go into... Uh, areas that are known as hot spots where they've been causing a lot of problems for the local communities or people in the outskirts. They'll send a team in and they'll basically go from there and, and do a search. And if they come across the individual or individuals causing the problem, they'll put them down in short order. But it's nothing real. It's stuff that leaks out. It's nothing they're going to put on the news and say military special ops comes in, puts down Bigfoot. You know, it just kind of leaks out from the community that they were in, and it's kind of passed along the grapevine. But I know it's true. It's happened before. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine um, they wouldn't be real excited about it, hitting the local media and that sort of thing especially the national yeah, they'll keep it they'll keep it hush hush but other than problems like that i mean you'll hear of things you know along the coast in central north carolina and the uari national forest and places like that with regular sightings but as far as units having to come in and put one down that's not something they'll put in the news or in the media that's just something that's basically heard locally through the grapevine but you can you can depend on it. It's not. It's not bull crap. Yeah. Well, I was just curious about what the uh, terrain is like, uh, the forest. Uh, it, it must be some thickly wooded areas for the creatures to remain concealed and also have a habitat. Yeah, up along the Appalachian Trail, it's yeah, it's it's heavily wooded, thick forest. It's perfect habitat for them and. You're not going to find them unless you have a good starting point and you got people that know how to track them and find them. But even then, that's when you're going to have the special ops come in, the helicopters, the infrared, stuff like that. 
Well, we'd like to borrow one of those helicopters. Um, right. Um, that? All the of North Carolina is uh, that's all in the Smokies out there, into the in the Appalachians out there, Asheville and all that area. It's uh, okay. extremely. Um, well, they call it mountainous. Uh, it wouldn't be mountainous probably compared to y'all's mountains. I mean, I've I've, I've been there through there plenty of times, but they have plenty of sightings out uh, towards the the coast and stuff too now. Yeah, you know, and there are. There's a guy that I watch who is from North Carolina, a YouTube channel. He he all he strictly does uh, hiking and backpacking and camping gear reviews. But they got some pretty respectable mountains there he's up there around six thousand foot elevation in some places so yeah they that's not bad the blue ridge is pretty thick up there it's uh high elevation really rocky really thick forest and woods if you don't know what you're doing you'll get lost in there real quick yeah um well and, and just from what I've seen, it's it's uh, yeah. There are some areas where it actually really reminds me of Oregon, where you have very Western Oregon, Western Oregon Cascades, where you have visibility in some of those areas, 15, 20 feet. You know, you want to stay on the trails unless you want to get lost. Well, the Appalachian Mountains are the oldest mountains in the world, and you can go back thousands and thousands of years and hear stories of weird creatures and sightings in that area. Interesting. You know, it's funny. A lot of people aren't familiar with terrain that thick. It's like, uh, and Tom, I've sent you, I sent you a picture once when uh, I took a, a small team into an area um, on the north side of mount rainier and as a kid you know we used to hunt there my dad used to would drive down in this area and and it was a pretty good road going in there well for many years the road's been blocked off there's no traffic nobody goes in there and when you walk down what used to be the road there's just a little deer trail because nobody goes in there and that's the only access in there and you can't literally see two or three feet beyond where you're standing in the brush because it's so thick and everything i mean it's really jungle like well, I'm going to give you a prime example. Um, coming at, at <clears throat> coming out of Asheville there, um, and I'm telling you, you try to pull that with a, a loaded horse trailer. Uh, some of those uh, mountains in there are pretty uh, pretty steep. They had a trucker that had a heart attack, and he was coming off of that uh, one of those um, coming down one of those mountains, and he went out actually went off the road and went down into the valley there. And it took them two months to find before they were looking for that uh, track that tractor. He didn't have a, a trailer on, but they were looking for that tractor, and it was so thick in there they couldn't find the thing. And they find, I mean, they finally found him, but he'd been sitting out there for two months in that uh, tractor. You know, and that's how thick that stuff is. And, and people always say, "Well, you know, how come Bigfoot isn't seen more often?" And, and I'll give you another example. I, I was bought, I was driving up to uh, Washington to visit my relatives for my birthday a few years ago, and uh, my car was I only had it a short time at that point, so it was brand new. And I thought, "Yeah, you know, I'm going to drive up." So I thought, "Well, you know, the weather." This was was early late February when I drove up. My birthday's in March, so I thought, "Well, I checked." the highway conditions going up I-5 and there was snow up around Shasta and then Grants Pass places like that and I didn't want to drive you know my Challenger in the snow <laughs> so I thought you know the coast is warmer let me go up 101 so I'm driving up 101 I get up to um oh she's I'm trying to remember it was still in Northern California but it was up closer to the Redwoods and the roads really it's just a two-lane road, and it's really windy, and there was kind of icy in places, so I'm driving carefully, and pretty soon I see some flares on the road, and I thought, uh-oh, somebody had an accident. So I get up to where uh, CHP was, and there were some other people standing around, and I'm thinking, well, I don't see a car. There's no accident. What's going on? Well, as I looked a little bit further, because I had to stop for a moment while traffic was passing because they had one lane closed, there was a full-size Class A motorhome. These guys had gone bonsaiing probably 70 miles an hour, missed the turn, went straight off into the brush. And it was probably 200, you know, 
feet or so inside the tree line. I would have never seen it driving by there because the brush was thick. Huh. Yeah. So that kind of Wonder. gives you an example of how thick brush is. You know, if you can't see a motorhome that went bonsaiing off into the timber, uh, how are you going to see something that looks like a tree, you know? Yeah, last time I checked, Bigfoot is smaller than a motorhome. Just a bit, yeah. I think just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Only you know, you talk about... Go ahead, TW. Only slightly smaller. <laughs> you know, and Pete, you mentioned uh, people will say, well, how come we're not seeing more often? Well, the same thing kind of goes for the footprints. Uh, Kurt, who, uh, you know, we've had him on the show before, uh, he and I have gone up into areas, these really thick areas. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you got, again, like I said, 15 foot visibility. You know, you got vine maples, you got roadies, you got all the, short scrubby stuff um but once in a while you find footprints well you remember i think it was when you and i were first talking tom that uh you sent me some pictures of where you you thought you saw this outline next to the stump or a tree there and i said did you find footprints and and i said you know you you have to look down at the ground once in a while and you went back and found footprints (laughs) that is exactly right yeah i found a stump that had been shredded up and uh and it really, it just stuck out like a sore thumb. And so I said, you have a picture? And I said, told him a picture. Both of you guys said the same thing. And I went back, looked at the ground, and that was, those are the first footprints, by the way. Yeah, hey, I'll tell I you, saw. I'll tell you something that happened just yesterday that kind of illustrates how little people will look down. In the parking lot of where I work, um, you know, we've got all our cars parked there, and it's kind of a big area in between, right? Well, there's, there's a couple of cats that live were there by the, the break room in the offices. And, and they kind of stick out like a sore thumb because they're, they're black and white. And, it's, you know, they're just easily seen, right? Well, one of the foremen was walking along and he tripped over one of the cats and broke two of his fingers. And I, and I said, well, did you, did you look down? Do you look down to see where your feet are once in a while? <laughs> where you're going? Yeah. I mean, it's not funny the guy got hurt, but, you know, it's like, it just kind of illustrates the point. How often do people look down to see what's on the ground around them? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I know around here, they'll get they'll get pretty active during the fall, and they can be in an area, you can find an area that's got tracks in it, but if you go back two or three days later in the fall, those tracks have been completely covered by pine from all the pine trees. It doesn't take long. I mean, some tracks will stay in an area for up to a month or so, and then it just depends on the weather conditions and soil, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> definitely, def- definitely depends on the, the condition of the soil. Yeah, and humidity in the air and what the weather's like and all that kind of stuff. Well, in the mountains, there's going to be a lot of rock and hard soil. So even if they're 1,500 pounds, a lot of times they're not going to leave a track if they know how to avoid doing that. You know, I kind of wonder, too, about, you know, some areas like, you know, having grown up near Mount Rainier, the area, people here kind of wig out if they get a a 4 or 5.0 earthquake. Well, you know, around Rainier, you get 5-point earthquakes all the time, and you, if you're born and raised there, you just don't notice them after a while. It just happen. Somebody say, oh, we had an earthquake yesterday. Oh, really? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> didn't feel anything. So, But that's got to do stuff to the soil, too, in certain areas. I mean, you know, it would probably add to oh, tracks di- yeah. disappearing quicker. Well, I'm, I'm laughing about the 4-point uh uh, earthquakes. You remember, I lived in Alaska. For oh, you get big years. ones there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we get big ones up there. I mean, if it's not a <clears throat> uh, six, seven, or eight, we don't even. <laughs> it's like, oh, the ground's shaking. But you know, I was in Olympia the day that 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 one hit. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> I was the... sitting. <laughs> the big one that moved the Capitol Dome. <laughs> I was I was literally on the phone with my husband and. Uh, he was talking to me back in North Carolina and um, hit Seymour Johnson. And all of a sudden, I got literally knocked out of the bed 
and I screamed. I mean, I didn't know what the heck at first was happening. We, we and I literally cut my out of the bed and screamed, and the phone went dead. We lost connection, and he didn't know if somebody had just walked in and murdered me. That was the last <laughs> he told me. To I, I don't know if you remember what year <laughs> and, there and was. Then, and then he couldn't get a. <laughs> then he couldn't get a hold of anybody. Go check on my wife. You know. But there was there was, was one. On the phone. <laughs> there was one, in, I think it was two thousand one. That was a seven point oh. And for that area, it was pretty big. I remember we were setting up a warehouse at the time, and and I was joking. The guy I was working with, they hired all veterans to work in his place. So me and the, and the guy I was working with was older. He was a Vietnam vet. And we were up on a scissor lift about 20 feet in the air. We were hanging these jack chains with signs, right, to mark. And nothing was in the warehouse except racking so far. And I, I told him, I said, I said, geez, we'd be screwed if an earthquake came right now. <laughs> He's like, quit saying stuff like that. Well, the very next day we were doing the same thing. And I looked out across the warehouse, and it was a big warehouse, 150,000 square feet. So there was, I don't know, remember how many, 30 or 40 rows of racking. And, and the, gr- the grates that sit on the racks, all of them were jumping back and forth. And I could looked up and I could see the lights kind of swinging back and forth. And I said... I said, crap, get this thing down. There's an earthquake. There's an earthquake. About that time, you know, it really hit the building hard. And uh, <laughs> so be careful what you say, right? <laughs> yeah, careful what you wish for. Well, that, that particular one, the uh, parking, I was on the Holiday Inn, and it had a creek that ran around behind the back of it. It was really pretty. I mean, very picturesque and everything back there, but it wasn't so picturesque when the earthquake got through with it because they had a big mudslide on the other side that came down into it, and then the parking lot dropped uh, a foot. And I had my big uh, <clears throat> F-350 Dually parked out there with a six-horse trailer in the back parking lot <laughs> with no way to get it out of the parking lot. They oh, had to no. call in wreckers. To, <laughs> yeah, and they had to call in wreckers to come lift us uh, out and over the the this this drop in the parking lot. So I was like, uh, I got four wheel drive, but uh, the trader doesn't come kind of equipped with that. So it's not gonna work. I, I had to laugh a couple of days ago. We had a safety meeting, and they were saying managers were saying, "Well, in the event of a natural disaster such as an earthquake, shelter in place. Don't don't run in or run out of a building." And I thought, you people are out of your minds. You've never been in a big earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> we we ran our butts out of that building as quick as we could. <laughs> yeah, buildings come down on top of you. <laughs> right. I I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be a squishy, you know, for big chunks of concrete. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no right. Well that's, no, a, little, uh, building, so that's I mean, a little off topic for Bigfoot, I guess, but <laughs> Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, yeah, we need to move on here. I <laughs> wonder what Bigfoot do in earthquakes <laughs> when the right? earth moves. <laughs> shelter in, wonder, shelter in place. <laughs> <laughs> hey cuz. Yeah. You think uh you know how birds and dogs and some animals can sense an earthquake is coming? Do you think a Sasquatch has that ability? Yeah, probably. I mean, you know, if other animals do, they could too. Why not? Yeah. Well, didn't wasn't there speculation that there nobody found anything at? at of course, we'd never know if they did, anyways. But well, I'm out saying Helen's. A- yeah, you know, I, I I've mentioned it before. The unit I was stationed with at Fort Lewis, I was squad leader with the three five air cab at the time and our helicopters we did a lot of the rescue work there when after it blew and you know i knew dozens of the helicopter pilots and they all knew what i was doing as a hobby and they would have told me and, and there was nothing ever said nothing ever found i even asked a few of them they said no nah, there was you know they, they didn't even find that many people and they they said you know most of the animals had already bugged out of the area you know weeks before the mountain blew you know what's funny is is the Air National Guard got a lot of credit for doing a helicopter rescue. They did, and it was the regular army that was doing all that. Yeah, yeah. But you know they do that. that. When I fought forest fire years ago in Southern Oregon, we we got called out on an eighty thousand um, acre fire the day after that we graduated the fire academy for the Forest Service, and there were six thousand of us in the base camp that were contracted with the Forest Service, right? Well, they brought in 1,500 troops from Fort Lewis, 
and they were they were MPs. All they did was direct traffic, and in the newspapers and in through the little town of Burns, you know, they got hailed as heroes when we were the ones out fighting the fire every day. They were sitting in their tents and guarding the road junctions, and you know. Having been a soldier, you know, not long, that long before that, you know, I, I'm part of me was like, yeah, I'm glad these guys are getting some credit, but they didn't do crap out there. <laughs> you know, we were the ones doing all the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, the Air Force fire. You know, that was a situation too. I, I got to know quite a few people in the base camp. You know, in the leadership. You know, under because uh, FEMA was actually running that. And they do a lot of the big fires because they do all the coordination and stuff to have the funding. Uh, so I got to know the incident commander and a bunch of the people who were in charge. And, and I kind of worked it into questions, you know, if there was anything weird that was seen. And um, nobody reported anything. So I'm guessing, you know, a place like that, it was in a location where there would have been Bigfoot around. In fact, um, when I talked to um, the head of the cultural committee at the Klamath Reservation years later, uh, he told me a story about a native firefighting crew that had contracted with the Forest Service. And they actually had one of the creatures run out of the fire into their midst and fell down and got up. And they said its hair was smoldering and it got up and ran off. But somebody cast the handprints. And uh, and he was telling me the handprints were on display uh, at some facility in Klamath Falls for quite a number of years. And then, then they, they disappeared, so they don't know whatever happened to the handprints. But... It was interesting, but, uh, you know, people, at least on that particular fire, nobody had reported anything. So I'm guessing the creatures, and along with the other wildlife, had bugged out, you know, as that fire spread. It spread pretty fast. You know, and you had another one where one of them was sneaking up. I I guess they did airdrops for supplies. Well, I know he's now retired, but he was a, a Cal Fire captain. And and he he's actually had stuff happen on his property in the Sierra Nevadas that hopefully I'll be able to get over there. And, and he said I can go over there and look around his property anytime. But um, he had some markings and some scat and some other things there. But anyway, they were on one of the fires a few years ago, uh, and he was texting me. He says, "Yeah, I mean this other other captain. We were by this. They had a big food drop and some of the uh, oh you know support elements for the crews out fighting fires." And they were discussing something about the fire when they noticed over by where the food drop was, one of these creatures was sneaking up on the food drop. (laughs) And he says, I I had never seen one. I saw stuff on my property, but lo and behold, there it was. And and me and this other captain saw it. We were watching it. And uh, apparently it took some of the items and slunk back off into the forest. Huh. Oh, we got somebody scuffing around on the. That's, that's, that's TW's radio. Oh, it is. Oh, I got you. Okay. He's he's on the job talking to us. So. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I got a I got an active warrant, so. <laughs> Pick up a dirt bag that decided he wanted to starve a dog for two weeks. Oh, nice guy. Oh. Yeah, what a minch. Always, always one out there. So this thing actually got some of the supplies? Uh, apparently so, yeah. And, you know, there were other incidents, and it was nice knowing somebody in Cal Fire, because, especially a captain, because I'd get information, you know, things going on in, in certain areas. Unfortunately, he's oh, retired now, but he still has contacts, so. Yeah. Well, I've wondered about the fire crews um, because I've I've talked to rangers from two or three different ranger districts who just flat out say, yeah, these things are out there and we run into them. And I just wonder if the fire crews do the same thing. Well, I'm sure. I mean, of course, one thing with fire crews, I mean, um, a fire crew is usually 23 people and... um, you know, you're, a lot of what we did was sweep areas for hot spots because the terrain was such that they brought in uh, bulldozers and the bulldozers were able to cut the fire line much more effectively than fire crews could, um, you know, to contain the fire perimeter. But, um, 
you know, you've got all these, you've, you've got lots of people out, especially where there's a big fire. Like I said, there were 6,000 of us in the base camp, and it was pretty much a 24-hour operation. But, you know, you've got a lot of folks out there on foot uh, doing this stuff. So that would kind of be a deterrent for the creatures. But, you know, you would you might see tracks and things like that or actually see the creatures if they're, um, you know, hunting deer and things like that that are coming out of the fire. Yeah, yeah. Well, Unless they get turned into a certain area, I'd be shocked if I saw one out there in the middle of a forest fire. It happens, though. You know, it really yeah. does. Well, I can I see it on the outskirts of one. What's that, Tom? Well, I've wondered about the hot shots, you know, that, that uh, jump into certain areas. They're the only guys there. Yeah, they're much they smaller might, teams. Smaller teams, but they might be trying to see something that the other guys you know the thing is though if you're if you're fighting a fire the fire is your focus that's number one the second thing is you're watching the weather that's something they taught us in the fire academy was you have to know about the weather and air conditions and temperature constantly because you won't you don't want to be in the path of where the fire is heading so you have to you have to have that it has to be you have to be conscious of that all the time so you're really focused on those kinds of things because you have to be able to move quickly if the fire changes direction heading towards you. Oh, yeah. And even with those blankets, it's not a good thing. Well, you know, that was that was the final test, I think, in the academy was you had to deploy that. And uh, it's a little silver tent, basically, you, you put over yourself. And you have to hold it where an instructor would come up and grab it and literally try to yank it off you as hard as they could. And and if you're able to hold on to it, then you passed. <laughs> But it, but you it was got necessary. Off easy, cause. But it's necessary because they showed us films of uh, there was a water truck, and um, there were there were two fire crews on either side of this road, and the fire truck was utterly destroyed. I mean, there was there wasn't a whole lot of it left. The fire was so intense, and the people in one crew didn't deploy. I think I think all but three of them were killed, and the other crew had theirs deployed correctly, and they were fine. A little scorched, but they were okay. Yeah. Well, I was a firefighter. The first thing we learned was that the for, a forest fire is the most dangerous fire you can be in, not a house fire. Oh, yeah, if you, and, especially if you've got a lot of fuel. Yeah, and whenever we had our test for a firestorm, we didn't just get under the blanket and see if the instructor could yank it off of you. They simulated a fire all around us. Well, we had to, it was, it was a fairly quick situation. I mean, at that time, so I kind of, they kind of had to get us through there. I, I think they already knew we were going to be called out on the fire the next morning. We were expecting to go back to our homes and, gotcha. uh, and they, they kicked us out at four thirty in the morning and sent us on the fire. So I, I'm pretty sure that's it, what the no, deal was. It is a scary thing. I've been on ridge lines driving before or just over there is the entire side of a mountain that's on fire oh it's a very freaky unnerving when they took us out to actually see the fire the first day we couldn't get any closer than 300 yards to it it was so hot yeah i mean there was no way and the flames were geez they were they were at least 100 feet high of course it was all the timber burning but um you know you confront a wall of fire like that and you know that's a misconception too you're not you're not out there you know, actually fighting the fire, you're doing things to contain it so it doesn't spread. You, yeah. let, you let it burn out, essentially. Oh, yeah. We were fighting a small one one time, and our captain, who was in Vietnam, this was at night. He, unfortunately, had a flashback at the time, and he took that hose, and he started spraying everything and cussing up a storm. The fire was the least of our problems at that time. Uh Oh, (laughs) you know, well, yeah, that's, uh, that could be a bad situation. You know, it's it's too bad. He went through that though. But the big, but the Bigfoot stuff, I mean, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure they leave fires pretty quick when they happen, unless, like I said, it's a situation where, you know, you get opportunists that are going to go up and grab, like, you know, the fire, Cal fire captain said they were, they were out there scoping out the food drop. Um, you know, I mean, you know, when you're behind the fire a little bit, you're, it's a little calmer and there's not so much stuff going on. 
did you guys ever, either one of you, uh, Dave or Will, did either one of you guys find wildlife that had been overtaken by the wildfire? We didn't, but we saw living wildlife. I saw one or two deer that were overtaken by smoke, but that's about it. Okay. We we saw, I remember one day there was a big porcupine. I mean, a really big one. It was just kind of waddling along, and we're all like, oh, we better hang back a little bit and let him, let him have the right of way. And then another morning there was a, a big timber rattler. I mean, a big one, man. It, I can just imagine how much that would have hurt getting bit by that son of a gun. Uh, but it was cold, so it was kind of lethargic. So we were able to walk up and, and look at it within a couple of feet. It was just too um, too lethargic to do anything. But uh, we watched it for a short time. Then we left Mr. No Shoulders alone and went away. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Smart move. But, yeah, you see wildlife when you're out like that. So, I mean, for a Sasquatch to be around wouldn't surprise me. Well, and they would you would think they would react. They would say, well, the fire's over there, but it's not over there. I think I'm going to go where the fire isn't. Yeah, and, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, like there's probably stuff around, you know, everybody's supposed to police up after themselves after they have lunch and stuff, but, you know, they're, they're going to be around looking for uh, easy, easy pickings if you're leaving garbage and stuff around, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Forrest, Chuck, what do you guys think? You guys are quiet. Well, I was just I was just listening to you guys talk about this fire stuff. And um, last week uh, here in Oklahoma, we had a big fire going on uh, around the Oklahoma City area. And it actually demolished uh, several hundred houses, I think. And um, it, of course, around here, we got red cedar. And it's been real, real dry here. And winds were blowing about 50 miles an hour. And, boy, when that when that sucker hit, it was Katie bar the door because uh, that fire spread like crazy. Dang, that'd be no fun. <laughs> they, had part of the, they had several parts of the interstate that were actually shut down because the smoke and the flames were so bad, they, they had to take people off the highway well you know i don't so, like to talk about cars i lost everything i had in one including nine cats oh no yeah they're not good so, things that's for sure that's a same <clears throat> subject with me so but i did want to add I, that's not to change the subject on you guys but i did uh <laughs> something i was going to ask you and I didn't know if we'd ever, ever discussed this before, but I was kind of curious. What did <clears throat> DeHendon and Green ever think about? What did they think Bigfoot was? Did they think it was Gigantopithecus and, you know, it, it, <laughs> you know it, it evolved? They kind of did. That, it, was kind of the, that was kind of the train of thought at the time. In fact, I remember the first time I saw the, <clears throat> the mock-up that Krantz made of a Gigantopithecus skull. And I found out mm-hmm. later he did it incorrectly. The measurements were wrong. It's, it, the skull was too small, and there were some other problems with it. But uh, I saw it at Green's house, and I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. I, I had no idea, you know. And uh, I don't think I'd even been to college yet at that point. So I thought, well, you know, these guys know what they're talking about, you know. And <clears throat> But that was their belief. There's a lot of researchers that still believe it's a uh, descendant of Giganopithecus. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, it's very well could be, but, you know, I mean, it, we, none of us know for sure. So, I mean, you know, any one one theory is as good as another theory, I think, right now. So, until we uh, know <clears throat> know for sure, there, of course, there may be somebody out there that does know for sure, and we're just, uh, you know, living in the dark over here. Well, I can't but, remember. Uh, there was there were some reasons why um, that probably was not a relative of a Gigantopithecus. I can't remember what they are off the top of my head, but. I remember reading something a few years ago, and it sounded like a pretty sound theory why they were not related to them. Well, I think I think that they have pretty much, uh, you know, of course, they're finding more parts to Gigantopithecus. You know, the 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 way I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, how they originally came up with, you know, originally it was nothing more than just teeth. Right. And, uh, Von Koenigswald in 1935 the, found teeth in a yeah. Chinese market. 
Yeah. Was... Well, that's why they, they were going to these apothecary shops in uh, China because the Chinese like to grind up things uh, like that because they think it gives them uh, virility and it, you know, whatever. You Med- know. Medicinal purposes, um, yeah. Yeah, medicinal purposes. We'll just call it for that. So anyway, and that's that was now well, they're finding more parts and pieces to them, and they're they they really think that they probably were something very similar to an orangutan, and uh, that they were probably <clears throat> more quadrupedal than bipedal. And as we know, all the great apes at some point in time will stand up and walk bipedally, but they don't have those big glutes and stuff like what we have, and and what Bigfoot. Bigfoot has as well, and I think that's why Bigfoot bipedal and uh, um, you know has uh, just developed that way. But uh, they, they for a while, I mean, I can see why somebody would think that they would develop from uh, Gigantopithecus blackie. But uh, you know, there is similarities. But and who's not to say that maybe they did? And at some point in time, um, you know, Gigantopithecus developed into. You know, Bigfoot, we don't know for sure. Well, I, and of course, there's some people out there that try to say they're human. One, one of the problems, I know one of the problems with the Gigantopithecus is because of dentition, they knew they were herbivores. <laughs> so, that, well, yeah, they were herbivores. so that creates a problem with Bigfoot because their diet would almost certainly have to con- uh, consist mainly of protein. And we see that with the scat. So, um, you know the well. You know you you know the dentition. Uh, you've also got you know you, you comparative uh, gorillas. I mean they're they're uh, strictly uh, uh, you know herbivores. Uh, they don't uh, uh, they're not like chimpanzees. They're not out there killing and maiming uh, smaller monkeys and other chimpanzees. Uh, uh, gorillas don't do that. And but I know that I read something here not too long ago on uh, the Gigantopithecus that uh, they think that maybe the reason that uh, Gigantopithecus disappeared from the, you know, they were they were a uh, Pleistocene era animal, and they <clears throat> um, that the actual vegetation that they were feeding on they figured was something more like bamboo or mm-hmm. anything because they had these huge huge molars that were for grinding and such and that's what they need and i guess it's very similar to what the dentition in a panda is right. which i am not familiar with at all and i won't even claim the familiarity there but anyway uh, they say that the, in the particular areas that they're finding them uh these fossils in that they started uh that type of vegetation started disappearing so they think that from what they were seeing with the teeth, that there was a certain amount of decay occurring on the teeth. So they think that they may have gone to eating fruits and such, which have sugars mm-hmm. and, of course, the specific acid in them was decaying and the, it was destroying their teeth. So this may have actually brought about their downfall. Yeah, it could be. That's why we don't see them roaming the forests of China now. Yeah, it could very well be. Teeth, when they found those teeth in the town of Mark, didn't they actually decide to go explore some of the caves in that region and find more? Well, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Va- they've, Va- they've, they've done a lot more, made a lot more discoveries here of uh, light. Yeah, you know. I think it was Chinese scientists that have looked into it after that. It was von Koningswald made the first discovery in 1935, and he found 35 or so teeth, and um, and he, you know, he named it and everything. Um, and I think they did some renaming after that because he, it wasn't quite correct early on. But I, I believe the Chinese scientists have found since then four jaws and, and a number of other teeth. I don't think they found any other bones, per se. No, I think it's all been skull material. Uh, and, and see, we, we, part of the problem is, you know, we have this, this thing called Red China that happened. And, and so most of your Western... Uh, anthropologists and primatologists were kicked out of the area so they couldn't do any any more uh, you know field work there and now since uh, a lot of this stuff has opened up and there's more <coughs> free flow of thought you know they've allowed anthropologists and and uh, primatologists into the area so they're being able to do more you know studies you know in my first book notes from the field I used the example of the gigantopithecus not to show that it was you know, the ancestor of the Sasquatch. What's important about it, it demonstrates 
that there have been primates of that kind of size and everything. So, you know, if one existed, why couldn't another one or others? <clears throat> well, exactly. Cause, you know, because who was it that found that body and the wife took the skull and they took it home and put it on their mantle and it was like five times the size of a, a person's skull or something? Well, the story was in now, and it's funny, you know, John Green's books have been changed a few times. <laughs> I used to have some of the, the, the early copies, the ones that were actually stapled together with no backing or anything. The you know, I'm talking about the ones that look like like um, um, on the track of the Sasquatch in particular. And I, I can't remember if it was that one or the second one, but there was a story in one of his books where a couple were on vacation and they would go prospecting up the coast of British Columbia when they went on vacation. So they were up there, and on the way out, they found a partially de decomposed carcass of one of the creatures by a lake shore. And, yeah, that's the one. And they had some discussion that um, whether they should take any of it. The wife wanted to take some of it. Husband said, no, we don't have any room. Uh, she snuck the jawbone into a pack. And the story went, it sat on their mantle place for 14 years. People had come over. They could put the thing over their whole face. Uh, and then after, you know, 14 years, this uh, house caught on fire, burnt down, and, and everything was lost, including the jaw. That has to be a hot fire to turn bone to ash. Well, house fires tend to get pretty hot, so. No, they usually get about 1,200 degrees. I don't think that's hot enough. Well, apparently in that case it was, or, you know, whatever's left, they probably just, you know, either, either probably abandoned, crushed in the debris. either yeah. abandoned or the debris was just hauled off. Yeah. And I don't even remember what time frame this was. It was, it was some time ago though. Yeah. There's some stories out there that, uh, it's not like one has never been found or parts have never been found. Green had another story about the Warner ranch in Northern California. And unfortunately, it was happening when these girls, I think they were, I don't know, 12, 14 years old, something like that. They were, you know, walking on a logging road and found uh, the corpse of one of these things. And they took off running and um, Green didn't learn about it till I think a couple decades later. And of course, he said he went there and there was nothing to find. Well, duh, after that long, there wouldn't be anything to find. Didn't somebody interview them about that? They was may have. I, I, yeah, well, he did, yeah, I believe, yeah. Okay. It's been a long time since I read the, the account in that book, but uh, that was kind of the gist of it. Yeah, he had some good ones. Yeah, I mean, there, there have been bodies found. Um, you know, it's not like... It's not like they haven't been. People say, well, how come there aren't any parts of any? Well, there were there were stories that go way back. I mean, and Green noted those. I mean, um, I'm trying to think of the years. We're talking, you know, early 1800s, where I know there was one account where, you know, and I don't remember who the parties were, but if the one person was a doctor or what he was, but he received a letter from people who found something, and they described it, wanted to know if he wanted parts of it or whatever, I mean, these things have happened periodically over time. And then there's the Jacko story that happened in 1882, you know, where the train crew actually captured a juvenile. You know, and then the story goes, um, it wasn't actually in the article, but there was, and I can't remember the source, the information where they talked about later, um, where the one guy who actually took ownership of the creature was going to take it to Europe to display it. And apparently the creature died en route. And, of course, in those times, they would have just thrown it overboard. Same with people. They didn't, those were disease, sources of disease, so they, they would just discard anything or anyone that died on ship. And, of course... Yeah, and that happened in Coke, B.C. Yeah, and, of course, they, they, you know, they didn't know what they had. And it was just uh, some unusual animal. Yeah, there's, there's actually a store... Uh, and hope British Columbia that you can go in and they've got pictures and articles and stuff posted on the wall there about um, about it. I mean, the whole town saw the thing, so it yeah. wasn't like it was just one or two people. Right. Uh, and then they, they and then somebody got the bright idea that they were going to shave it and see what it looked like underneath. 
which I'm sure didn't, didn't oh, help Lord. poor animals, you know. Well, and so, they talked about it in the article. Yeah, they talked about it in the article it would sweat profusely. Um, you know, I, I'm sure like most wild animals right. used to being outside. Yeah. Well, I've sent you pictures. Uh, if somebody wants to see what a, a Bigfoot looks like uh, without hair, uh, I've sent you plenty of pictures of the, uh, you know, chimps. The, chimps and the, the chimps with alopecia. Yeah. 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 You want to see something? I mean, yeah. you have people have no idea yeah, what leave, the muscular we'll on leave, those let's, animals. Let's leave are. the hair on the chimps. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, you you like the the chimpanzees with hair on them. Yeah, they look much better with hair. Kind of kind of scary looking how muscular they are. Yeah, really. I mean, uh, <laughs> all these bodybuilders because. would love to come equipped with a body like that. Right. Yeah, what's up? Uh, when you were in college and you used to clean bones, sometimes how many how many Sasquatch bones do you think are actually laying around in colleges right now that have been misidentified? Well, I didn't clean bones. What I got stuck with was mostly clamshells, but um, that's something <laughs> our you know our, we've talked about when we had our forensic anthropologist John on a few times. He's brought it up, and I, and I think first we've all talked about it too. Um, you know, there could be thousands of them laying around in colleges and, and the thing with colleges are, you know, that stuff gets, it gets clean, it gets processed, it gets, you know, numbered and labeled and stuck in a box, which usually, I think that's what the, what state laws usually require from archeological finds. And it never gets looked at unless somebody comes along and wants to do a study and utilize that stuff. And that stuff might sit in a box forever and never be looked at it again. So there could be lots of it out there, not just colleges, but there are facilities. Um, and TW, you probably know this being a cop, you know, where sometimes there's just a, a finger or a toe or something that's found out there and nobody knows where, who it belongs to. And they have facilities they send that stuff to. Well, you know, you find a bone. Uh, What's that? A lot of times, if it's something we don't know what it is, we send it to a forensic pathologist. Right. And if they can't goes to the Smithsonian. Yeah, so the stuff just sits there and... Yeah, just... You know, or if they can never identify it, it's something so unusual, uh, it just sits there forever. Yeah, if nobody nobody takes an interest in studying it, who cares? It sits in a box. Well, I mean, there's a... uh, There's a prime example of there was a, a piece a wooden uh, piece that came from and I think Tom and I've discussed this before <clears throat> that came out of a Indian mound and it was uh, uh, I don't remember now what the date on it was but it was certainly pre-Columbian and uh, but it came out of a Indian mound and in, um, back east and uh, it was in Tennessee and some gentleman was <clears throat> going through the was looking for something else and just happened to see this piece of wood laying in the drawer and i mean they're long and they're and they're mounted on uh there's foam in the bottom of these drawers and they're big drawers that pull out this is what we used to use they probably have something far more modern nowadays to, uh, than what we were using but they were all wooden drawers and they pull them out and they hit foam in the bottom and the pieces were numbered and everything else laying in there <clears throat> well this gentleman just happened to be trained in uh aramaic which is ancient hebrew it's a uh you know that language that, you know, the early, early Hebrews uh, um, spoke. And he was drivers. looking at this. Uh, excuse me? The early slave drivers used to speak. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, it was, it, this piece of wood was written in, um, <laughs> He recognized it and turned. Somebody just thought it was scribbling on a, a, a wooden uh, piece of wood, and he turned it around. It was upside down, and he read it, and it said, "In the name of Judah." And this was found in an Indian mound. Hmm. That'd be a little yeah. out of place, wouldn't it? Yeah, just a yeah, little. 
you know, those wandering Jews, uh, what can I say? Well, I suppose it's like with bone. I mean, unless unless you were that familiar with with different, like a like or John, a forensic anthropologist, and you happen to see something that just didn't fit, it'd be ignored. Well, I mean, I I think honestly, um, <laughs> and um, that most of the stuff, first off, the stuff that we ever found, artifacts that we found and sites, all had to be gone over by our professors. Mm-hmm. And, and, and my, my professors, uh, some of them had degrees in anthropology, some of them had degrees in archaeology. But let's face it, if you're an archaeologist, you have to have classes in anthropology. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, have to be familiar, you have to be familiar with all that stuff. And uh, and some of these guys are, are double degreed, and uh, they all had doctorates, and uh, so they weren't stupid people. They could pretty much look at something and tell whether it's uh, human or not. And uh, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that I could probably do that even even now if I was to go out and pick up a bone, that I could pretty much tell what, what it came from, but uh, um, you know, immediately. But uh, Sometimes if something's broken, it, you have to really kind of look at it and analyze it and turn it over and upside down and every which way, uh, you know, to figure out, okay, where did this come from? And, uh, you know, it, it's a guessing game sometimes. But You know, my experience you know, with professors was that they had to be, they had to have an interest in something that was brought in. I saw things brought in and sometimes they're like, yeah, okay, you know, just go ahead and label mm-hmm. it and put it in the box. <laughs> they didn't seem, seem to be too interested. And I thought, oh, okay, that's kind of, that's interesting. Well, I guess I guess maybe because I I went to the university that I went to uh, first, <laughs> and they they always were very hands on and and really uh, and you know they now have one of the foremost archaeological departments in in the uh, the world as far as when it comes to Middle Eastern and uh, uh, Egyptian archaeology and even Southwestern archaeology for that matter. They are they are the go to university for that. Uh, and if you guys, of, you guys uh, remember me, <clears throat> you remember me talking about we we found uh, our family friend Charlie found that bear carcass, and it was just bones. I mean, there was still some hair left there, but everything was gone except for the bones. But it hadn't been touched except for the skull was crushed in. I, yeah. uh, <clears throat> I in my back of my pickup, I laid out a poncho half, shelter or shelter half, and uh, I laid all that out as close as i get to the way i I picked it out one bone and i put it in the truck took pictures of it and i took it to the college i was going to and nobody seemed to be of any interest to it except uh one of the more senior students we had there and he identified it but but the professors could have cared less (laughs) they didn't have any interest at all in helping me identify what the animal was so once upon a time science was not like that well, again, it just depends on the people that are there, you know, if they take an interest in something or if they don't or if they're busy or, you know, it just depends on the person. Well, we're starting to get kind of short on time, guys. Um, Tom, did you have anything before we wrap this piece up? Well, as always, uh, and it's worth repeating, or say it again. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And even though this is the campfire talk, if you guys have questions, those go to our Q and A show and send them to questions at creekdevil.com. And if you want to support the show, you can do that. Uh, we have a Patreon link in the description. And as always, click the like and subscribe before you leave. If you haven't done so already. And with that said, I'm going to hand the, the mic off to Forrest. Forrest don't want it. You don't have- <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're on the spot there, Forrest. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> My phone just went bleeped out. I don't know what happened. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's a good excuse. <laughs> I, just, I heard you say you're going to hand the mic off to me, and all of a sudden I'm going to you're going to hand the mic off to me, and all of a sudden then my phone went dead. <laughs> That's Obviously, a good God excuse, not, any. God did not want me to speak at this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we're. He, he, he said, he said, Forrest, you're celebrating Passover. Be nice now. <laughs> <laughs> he knows who this crew is. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, speaking of Q&A, we're going to do that in just a moment, so everybody stay, stick around when we're done with this session. But uh, anybody else got anything before we wrap this up? Uh-oh, I think we lost somebody. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, I, you know, as usual, we never know where the conversation in Campfire Talk goes, and that's the whole idea. You know, we talk about whatever, and it's not always Bigfoot, so if everybody thinks it's just going to be Bigfoot... Um, don't get used Guess to what? that. <laughs> well, I will say this. we But we do try and steer it. If it gets off course for too long, we try to steer it back on course or something Bigfoot related. Well, so, some of it's applicable. We I mean, we talked about forest fires, right? And we kind of went into that. But, you know, there are Bigfoot related things that go along with that. So kind of understanding those situations you know, if, if people have, like, questions about forest fires and Bigfoot, you know, maybe the talk will stir up those questions and send us those questions, and we'll talk about those on the Q&A. All right, guys. Well, having said that, we'll close this session. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>